So all these rainy days we've been having lately make this a good time to talk about water relations of plants. Deserts are areas on earth where there's little or no rainfall, sometimes no rain for years in a row. But when it does rain, seeds in the seed bank quickly sprout and give rise to little herbaceous plants, desert annuals, that flower quickly in the next week or two, get pollinated and set seed. The seeds then wait in the soil in the seed bank, in the sand, I guess, for a long time till it rains again. Here's a common fern here in South Florida, Pleopeltis polypodioides. We call it commonly the resurrection fern. It gives you an indication if you need to water your plants or not in your garden. You can see that if it's dry, the plant looks kind of shriveled up on the right, but following rain or dousing with the hose, the fronds open up and the plant starts actively photosynthesizing. It turns out there are certain proteins in the leaves, they're called dehydrins, that help plants like this withstand nearly total desiccation. In tropical dry forests, the dry season may be four to six months of no rain at all in contrast to the wet season with rain every day for some period of time. And a lot of tropical dry forest trees sprout their leaves and are green during the wet season and then drop their leaves in the dry season and then they flower. Here in subtropical South Florida, it's something like a tropical dry forest, not quite as extreme, and we have trees that do this too. Here's a pink trumpet tree, Tababuya rosea. We have yellow Tababuyas and many other flowering trees that are especially pretty early in the year in the dry season. So I think you'll remember from general bio and ecology how water moves through a plant, it's because the water molecules are polar with a little bit of positive charge by the hydrogens, a little bit of negative charge by the oxygen, and so adjacent molecules um, are linked to each other with a slightly weaker force than that within the molecule, but that lets water rise by capillary action and through the tiny tubes of the xylem, as the water evaporates from the surface of the plant, out the stomata by transpiration, these long chains of water molecules move up the stem of the plant. You probably know this, but if you get some cut flowers, they've been out of water for a little while, so there's air in their xylem for a few inches, but if you bring them home and cut the bottoms off, especially if you cut the bottoms off in a bowl of water or a pot of water and quickly stick them in a vase, they'll last much longer. So what affects how water moves in plants is something called water potential. Because plants lose water to the air as the stomata are open for carbon dioxide to come in because they need carbon to photosynthesize water vapor evaporates very easily out. And when leaf cells become drier, have less water in them, their water potential declines. And what happens is that water is then pulled up through the xylem tubes into the plant from the roots. These are some cool photos of what stomata look like. The one on the left is a longitudinal section right through the stomata. The little S indicates is in one of the guard cells of the stomata. The E is for epidermal cell. The N are the accessory cells. And then I is the intracellular space into which gases diffuse or water vapor can come out. And if we look at the picture on the right, this is a surface view with the big epidermal cells and here and there little stomata. 
Plants have many different strategies to deal with water and have become adapted in a variety of ways that we give names to. Mesophytes are those plants of mesic conditions, that is moist conditions. Some plants grow in water. Aquatics, and we have emergent aquatics like we see here on the bottom. There are submerged aquatics that live most of their life totally underwater and floating aquatics that aren't anchored and float usually on the surface of the water. On the right is a plant that is a xerophyte adapted to xeric conditions or very dry. These are plants of deserts and also, as it turns out, plants that sit on other plants, epiphytes. Halophytes are plants that can withstand very salty situations and we find them growing in salt marshes or next to the sea. Some plants look kind of normal but then they can tolerate drought like that resurrection fern. Some plants are drought avoiders which means that they just don't grow when situations are dry. They perhaps like the desert annuals or actually, no, those account as ephemerals. A drought avoider would be a plant that has its above ground parts or leaves only when conditions are moist and then drops those parts when things are dry. Drought deciduous plants just drop their leaves in those situations like many of the dry trees of the tropical dry forest. And then there are plants called phreatophytes, like this picture on the left, with a very, very deep root system that can tap into the underground water table. Here's one of our iconic aquatic plants, the red, well, two different kinds of mangroves. The upper left is a red mangrove with aerial prop roots, and lower right, we see especially the pneumatophores, the breathing roots of the black mangrove, these are different adaptations of the roots to aerate those underwater parts of the mangroves. These are also halophytes, tolerant of salty conditions. And it's interesting, mangroves can grow pretty well in fresh water too. It's just that in these situations, other plants can't grow, so mangroves dominate. Here are some other trees of wet areas. These are cypress trees in a swamp. You can see a lot of green scum on the water, tiny little plants of different types. But the brown protuberances sticking up are cypress knees, they're called, but they're basically breathing roots too. In some parts of Florida um, and other parts of the country, people cut these knees off and decorate them and on one of the highways in Florida is assigned to a Cypress Knee Museum. Bald cypress loses its leaves during the drier time of the year. We have some of these near the biology building at FIU. Sometimes people think they've died, but no, they're just losing their leaves, changing over to new leaves. So plants and leaves themselves show special adaptations to dryness. Sclerophyly means leaves that are very tough, means having leaves very tough and leathery. Sometimes leaves have stomata not just on the bottom of the leaf but on both sides. That's called amphistomy. And another thing that could be on both sides of the leaves is the mesophyll, the palisade mesophyll full of chloroplast to receive the light. So isobilateral leaves are often held a little more upright or um, at right angles to the stem of the plant so that they can maximally receive light. And in really dry conditions, you may find plants not only with hairs on their leaves and other things to reduce water loss, but they may have the stomata deep within crypts that provide further protection against too much water evaporating. On the lower right, this is a plant that has isobilateral leaves. 
The very tough leaves of agave indicate that they are good at tolerating drought. You may know that historically sometimes people have cut the point off an agave leaf, like the one on the right, and used it as a needle with fibers of the plant-like thread. In the back of that agave is another drought tolerator, an opuntia cactus with leaves reduced to spines and stems photosynthetic. In our book is a nice table summarizing properties of stomata on trees from different situations, moist and dry conditions, looking at the average or typical density of stomata, the size of the stomata, the length of the pore, the width of the pore, the area of the pore, and conductance for CO2. And you can see that, in general, plants of mesic environments have stomata that are longer and usually wider than those of xeric environments. And I think it's interesting to look at tropical forest trees and deciduous trees toward the middle here. Stomatal density is double on tropical forest trees, but their environment is more or less always moist, and their pores are substantially bigger. In xeric environments, you can contrast sclerophylls, things with tough leaves, and um, succulent plants, things with thick stems full of water. They have many more, the sclerophylls have many more stomata, and so greater conductance of CO2.